Hey there, and welcome to Northeast. My name's CJ, and I am so excited that you've decided to spend some time with us. You know, one of the things I love about online church is the ability for you to join us no matter what's going on in your life. Whether you're sick at home or traveling or your schedule just didn't line up, this is a way for you to connect with us here at Northeast, and I'm so glad that you've done that. Later on in service, we're gonna take communion together as a family. So if you've got those, go ahead and grab those items and we'll take them together later on. Right now, we're gonna start off service the way I love the most, and that's singing to God. So let's do that together right now. Well, welcome to Northeast. We are so glad you're with us today as we continue in our series on unhurried rhythms. And thank you for your folks at home. I know you want to stay committed this year, showing up at church. So we're glad you're here. We know we got a lot of folks there today. And so glad you're engaging in the service. We'll encourage you to engage the whole way. You know, as we talk today about the unhurried rhythm of Scripture, we want to begin today by reading a Scripture that reminds us about the God that we are going to be singing our praise to, the God that we're going to be learning about today, the God that we want to grow closer to. And so this is out of Psalm 99. Will you stand with me as I read through this scripture and we begin our service today? It says, the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He's enthroned between the cherubim, those two angels on the top of the ark. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He's exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. Today, let us praise our God who is so holy and worthy of it. Let's praise him. Shine in the shadows 
It's so good to be with you and worship with you today. I'm going to teach you a new song, um, and I'm excited to sing this one. We're going to do it for the next couple weeks, and um, you may have heard it's been around for a little while, but um, I love the imagery in this song because uh, it reminds us that uh, whatever situation we're in, whatever um, tragedy, whatever loss, whatever hurt, whatever pain, whatever valley you find yourself in today, uh, God has the ability to take that and work it for the glory of his good. Um, he has the ability to take something that seems scary, something that seems terrible, and he turns it for good. He makes it beautiful. So I invite you today as we sing this song today, whatever you're going through, let's lay it in the hands of Jesus and allow him to take it and make something better out of it. Oh 
We have the privilege of watching somebody make the most important decision of their life, and that is to give their life to Jesus through baptism. So will you turn your attention over the baptistry for a minute? My name is Rick Davidson, and I serve as executive pastor at LaGrange Baptist Church, and this is my grandson, Jackson Streit. <clears throat> my wife, Penny, and I want to thank you as a church for loving him to Christ. And we want to thank you for the privilege of coming and participating in this event. Jax has known Christ for a time. And this morning, he wants to come and tell you as a church and, and the world what's happened to him. Jack, do you confess Christ, the Holy Son of God, as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Are you prepared and have you began a journey of submitting your life to him and following him 
and serving him all the days that he gives you. Because you have confessed Christ as your Lord, I am pleased to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. stand and sing once more with you.
Father, we, uh, we sing those words to you and I, I fully realize there's probably a lot of people who can hear my voice right now um, who have a hard time uh, singing that and meaning it. And so Father, today I pray that we can remember exactly who you are. You're a God of miracles. You're a God who's jealous for our attention and our affection and our time. You're an all-powerful creator who could very well be hands off, but instead you choose to live here in the dirt with us. You sent your son, Jesus, for us. You sent your Holy Spirit to now live within us. So God, we, we remember today that it is safe in your hands, in your arms. We place our lives and our trust and our hope in you because of who you are, because of what you've always been and because of who you will always be. And it's your great and awesome name that we sing and we praise together today. Amen. You can take a seat. Well, right now, I want to invite you to participate in a time of offering with us. You can give on the app, online at nechurch.org slash give, or in the boxes out in the lobby. And thanks to your generosity, our students have been able to gather and to worship together in our brand new renovated student center. I don't know if you've had the chance to be over there. Do you guys enjoy the new student center? They're really excited, I promise you. It is awesome. It is great to see. And at the same time, we've been able to rebrand our student ministry around that excitement, that momentum. And now they're called Northeast Youth. And it's been awesome to see them really uh, embrace this new moment, this new time. One of the phrases that I love in the branding is, is not youth without you. And that's our greatest hope, that every student finds a place to belong, finds a place to grow in faith, and to build those vital relationships through these foundational years of their life. You know, they've got a lot of great things planned this next year, and we need more volunteers who will step up and be involved in it, loving and encouraging and leading these students. If God is compelling you to do that, we want to encourage you. Go on nechurch.org slash serve for next steps and opportunities so you can really start to lead this next generation. You know, they are not just the future of our church. They are the future of our community. And so maybe God is calling you to be a part of that. We want to commission you today to continue to give generously so that we can offer a place for our students to grow and to belong. Thank you for that. You know, I don't know if COVID has taught you anything, but one of the things that's taught me is flexibility. Uh, and that is something that we are going to practice today. We were expecting to spend uh, one week in this Unhurried Rhythms uh, series to talk about Scripture. But now we're choosing to spend two to be flexible. And I think it's going to be a blessing. I, I've been a part of a men's mentoring group uh, for the last few months, and it's been an amazing thing in my life. And one of the constant conversations that keeps coming up is about Scripture itself. How do we know that we can trust what's in the Bible? How do we know that it's God's Word? And that's why we're blessed today to have with us Dr. John Weatherly. Dr. Weatherly taught me when I was in Bible college about 100 years ago. He taught Tyler when he was in seminary. And he's come alongside our elders a few times with some different studies to help them better understand God's Word so we can honor it and follow it. And I think you'll love him as well. So will you all welcome back to our stage Dr. John Weatherly. They didn't prepare me for that in seminary. Um, it is, it, despite this, it's great to be with you. Um, um, you know, this, this church has come to mean a lot to me. Um, I'm keeping my eye on you. 
uh, not in a, you know, find out the dumb things you're doing thing, but I just admire the ministry that this church has, your connection to the community, uh, the way that you are, are finding new ways all the time to be, to be salt in life, to show the love of God, uh, to, to witness uh, to, uh, to, to your city, uh, to, to connect to your world. And um, through, you know, my connection to uh, people who have been students and others, we know a lot of people here, my wife and I do, and we've come to know some of you as well uh, through the, the various connections that, that we have had. So um, I'm very glad to be here today. And since we are studying unhurried rhythms, to take not one but two weeks to talk about the unhurried rhythm of Scripture. Now, as we do that, I've got to confess it's a little ironic for me to begin in the way that I am going to because we're talking about, you know, establishing a rhythm of life that isn't dictated by media and screen and that kind of thing. So this is going to sound odd. I have Twitter friends. Okay. Yes, I am on, on Twitter. I am a twit. Uh, and um, uh, and I, there are people... That, uh, that I know, I feel I know them and I enjoy them, even though I don't know them as we say IRL in real life, uh, but I have come to know them through Twitter uh, and I really like them. Now, a couple of them are, you know, not terribly surprising in some respects. One's a literature professor uh, at, uh, at Houston Baptist University. Another one is an is a emergency room physician in, uh, in uh, South Bend, Indiana. Uh, these, but these are both Christians. But another person I would count as a, as, a, as a Twitter friend is a photographer in Glasgow, Scotland, who is an atheist. Uh, you might think, what, what in the world do you have in common with him? It's amazing. We have a lot of things in common. Uh, and I really enjoy the interchanges the, that, that I have with him. But over the years, he said some rather pointed things uh, in our conversations about the Christian faith and especially about the Bible. And I want to share two or three of those with you. Uh, a while back, he remarked, if only you Americans could get over worshiping ancient texts. Uh, he was talking about the Bible and I think the American Constitution. But well, let's focus on the Bible. Uh, at this point. Uh, he's, he, another time he said, Christianity is an authoritative belief system for which there's no evidence at all. And I didn't argue, I just listened. I said, I didn't mean to argue. Uh, on another occasion he said, the Bible is that magic book that says it's okay to hate gays. Now, I don't think he's right, but I understand some of the things that kind of drive that kind of thinking. And I think it's reflected in another remark that I came across several years ago, reading a book by Rosaria Champagne Butterfield, who was talking about her perspective on the Bible as a professor of literature, who at this point was not a Christian believer, though she is one now. She said, Christians always seemed like bad readers to me, too. They appeared to use the Bible in a way that Marxists would call vulgar, that is, common, or in order to bring the Bible into a conversation, to stop the conversation, not to deepen it. The Bible says always seemed to, to be like a mantra that invited everyone to put his or her brain on hold. The Bible says was the big pause before the conversation stopped. Huh. Well, these remarks reflect a view of the Bible that has been common in Western civilization, the cultural context that you and I live in, for at least three centuries. And I could speak to that authoritatively because I've lived through most of those three centuries. Not really. Uh, but even before that, it wasn't as if it suddenly sprang out of the, out of the brain of, of some late 18th century heretic. These ideas have been around for centuries as long as the Bible has existed. Uh, in fact. And this is the idea that the books of the Bible are historically suspect, that they are morally suspect. They talk about history and they talk about good and evil in ways that, you know, not, not so great uh, at best, that they are irrelevant to us because they're so removed from our context, our time. They are indeed out of date. We have moved on. We have attained progress. And these books are contradictory. How often, how often do folks say that? And I understand why they say these things. But I'd like us to consider that these characterizations of the Bible are so common that people can repeat them without really having thought about them. You know how that works. The kind of things that people say and hear others say and they hear them said so often and they say them so often that they believe they're true even though it's hard to kind of nail down why we think those things. It's hard to be specific about them. But, you know, here's, here's, uh, here's, here's what I realize. The Bible that I read, the Bible that has been 
really my life's work. I don't do honest work. I talk about the Bible all the time. Uh, this, this book is, to me, far more interesting and compelling than the book that people imagine. The actual Bible is much more compelling than the imaginary Bible that people reject. So this is what I want us to think about. And I want us to think about it because if we are going to enter into unhurried rhythms that are the, the, the kinds of things which will nurture our spirits, which will draw us closer to God, which will strengthen us for the challenges that, that we face um, in a way that just sometimes seems like an avalanche coming down a mountain. Um, if, if we are to do those kinds of things, then scripture needs to be incorporated into our lives by one means or another. But some of us are kind of on the sidelines with this because we are struggling with these same kind of, same kind of questions. For some of us, we, you know, we affirm that the Bible is God's word, but we read stuff that just confuses us uh, in this direction. For others of us, we're, you know, we're, we're, we want to be in on the Christian thing, but there's a lot of stuff about the Bible that just kind of puts us off, and we're not sure if we can really bring it, bring it in. Or maybe you, know, you are in that process of weighing and considering, and these kinds of questions are very real for you. Why do, why do you people put so much stock? In this book, we can't talk about everything uh, that needs to be talked about in that regard today. Heaven knows. But I'd, I'd like to, to think about this contrast between the Bible that I think people imagine, that they put at arm's length or reject, and what I'll call the real Bible that, that we experience when we read it as people of faith. Well, what is the Bible that people reject? It is, first of all, a flat book of rules. Now, rules, we get that. I'm sure you understand what, what we mean by that. People read the Bible to find out what's right and what's wrong, right? And when people say what Rosaria Butterfield said they said, the Bible says, usually what's following is something that sounds like a rule. Well, a flat book of rules would be something that is nothing but rules. Everything that you're reading is rules. And, and this is the impression that many people often have of the Bible. And because they, they see this, uh, you know, people read the Bible for rules and then they begin to look at it and they realize, you know what? This book doesn't really seem to work very well as a, as a book of rules because there are bad people in this book. They're doing kinds of things that, the kinds of things that, that are, are, are wrong. Okay, there's bigotry in this book. There's cruelty in this book. There are, there's patriarchy. There's genocide. There are weird dietary restrictions, okay? All kinds of stuff that is just hard to process as, as a kind of a guide to life. Now, here's something else that, that we often hear said that, that maybe we have said ourselves, that the Bible is a translation based on a translation based on a translation, that, the, that Bibles in English have been translated and retranslated so many times that we can't really sure, be sure what the Bible is actually supposed to be saying. It's an ancient book written in ancient languages that we don't read today, and, and its original meaning has kind of been lost through that process of a couple of thousand years. And something that's like a game of telephone. Did you, did you ever plan, uh, did you ever play telephone? If you went to middle school, you played telephone. Because whether you in a, were in a youth group or a public school setting, they made you whisper something in someone's ear and it went down the line. And you did that to teach middle school kids not to gossip. And it worked really well. No, it doesn't. <laughs> that kind of sneaks up on you, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, you always hear something garbled at the end. And people say, well, this is what's happened to the Bible. It's just lost in translation. Um, the Bible is a collection of pre-modern myths to explain what science now explains. You see, ancient people didn't have the advantages of the scientific method and the scientific revolution and the centuries of progress that we've experienced in the modern era. They, there were, the world was filled with mysteries for them. Why does it rain? Why is there thunder? Why does the sun rise in the east and set in the west? Why do some people have babies and other, people's, other people don't? And the answers that they tended to give, we are told, were answers that had to do with the divine. God does this, God does this, God does this. And so the Bible reflects that pre-modern, pre-scientific understanding, those explanations of natural phenomena. And of course, we're way past that. We have meteorology and geology and astronomy and biology and all the other ologies, all of which validly tell us what's going on, okay? 
Tell us, tell us what's happening in, in the world. The Bible is a contradiction-filled collection of legends. Uh, what do folks mean by this? Well, they mean that, you know, over time, uh, these stories kind of built up as, uh, through a process of folklore, that heroes were heroized, uh, great people were, you know, maybe picked out of the obscure past or just created out of whole cloth, and things were, were attributed to them, all of which were intended to reinforce the power structures of the society at the time. The, all of those stories were told to, to justify the kind of, of situation that people were living in and especially to keep the people in power who are in power, and so these legends build up. Another way of, of expressing this, the Bible is an ignorant expression of unenlightened morals. Ancient people had lots of understanding of what's right and what's wrong that you and I would reject. They thought that men are superior to women. They thought that some people are masters and other people are slaves, and so slavery is appropriate, necessary, and good. Uh, the children are the property of their fathers. People thought this. And they thought that some nations had stories of origin which were different from those of other nations. Other, some tribes had origins which were different from other tribes. And that justifies my tribe going to war against your tribe to, to take your land and take your money and to enslave you and to kill you. And so all of these beliefs were common in the ancient world, and all of them, were told, are reflected in the Bible. And so, you know, human, humankind has progressed. We have learned. We have matured. We have grown. We haven't arrived, but we're a lot better than we used to be. And here we are in the modern world with all of our progress, but the Bible is holding us back because people are quoting it and citing it, and we're getting all of this toxic stuff that's coming out of it. It's like a, a brain tumor, if you will, that you can't get rid of, and it continues to, to interfere with the processes of, of thought and judgment. Um, related to this, here's a, here's a phrase that some of us have heard. The Bible is an opiate of the masses. Yeah, this is, this is Karl Marx who explained all religion as an opiate of the masses. By what he, he, what, what he meant by that, was that, that religion in general, and the Bible in particular, is something that is used by those who have power and money to keep down the working classes, uh, to keep down the common people. So again, it's, it's there to kind of reinforce this, this power structure that exists. Well, I think of that and I think, yeah, if, if that's what the Bible is, I don't think that I want to read it, let alone regard it as something that's going to guide my life. But I don't think that's what the Bible is. This is not the Bible that I have come to know, that, that, that I experience. I understand why people draw these conclusions. I'm even sympathetic to some of them. But I think there's more going on than we realize. So what is the actual Bible? Various ways we can describe it to, and, and that, that address some of these mischaracterizations that, that we've talked about. First of all, the, the actual Bible is not one book. It is a collection of 66 diverse books. Diverse books, they're not all the same. They're not all books of rules. They're not mostly books of rules. Does the Bible provide rules for living? Yes. Is it all rules? Oh, heavens, no. And I mean heavens. Okay. No, it is a book which consists of different kinds of literature or, or what pointy-headed scholars like me call different genres. Ooh, that sounds like a French word. Are you sure I can trust it? Well, let me illustrate. Let's, let's imagine that, that for Christmas, I was given a book by one of my favorite authors, Reed Drummond, The Pioneer Woman. Yes, I like to cook. Why? I like to eat. Okay? All right, so, so you know, I, I, Reed Drummond has changed my life uh, with butter. And, uh, okay, um, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I get this book and I read it and I think I'm going to write a letter to, to Reed Drummond because I'm a little disappointed in this book. Dear Reed Drummond, a.k.a. The Pioneer Woman, I read your recent book and I want to tell you I am most disappointed that through its many pages you didn't solve a single murder. Now, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Cookbooks aren't about solving murders. It's not mystery fiction. It's not true crime stuff. 
okay? Uh, I, I, I'm not listening to one of those true crime podcasts here. It's a cookbook. It's supposed to tell me how to cook. I shouldn't write to the estate of Agatha Christie and complain, where was the recipe for beef stew in, in Murder on the Nile or Death on the Nile, right? New movie coming out in February. Can't wait. Uh, so, yeah, these are genres. We read books according to the rules that the books give to us. The Bible is, is filled with this different kinds of genres. We need to kind of enter into that and understand that. And then we realize not everything is a rule. Okay? Then we realize as well, here's, here's another point. It, it, it is these different genres are written to times and places that are different from ours. Now that doesn't mean that the issues were fundamentally different that, or that it's irrelevant to us, but just different in particular ways. For example, imagine a high school English class today, and some of us have a shudder, just be glad I didn't say math. Imagine a high school English class today, and the teacher says, okay, today we're going to read Walt Whitman's poem, O Captain, My Captain. And then, after the poem has been read, the teacher says, now what does this poem tell us about the Biden administration? And the answer is nothing. It's about the death of Abraham Lincoln. Okay, that was a while ago. Now, I might see phrases here that remind me of things in the present. Uh, but but it, is, it is in its own context. So we need to learn to read this book, not as a flat book, but as a diverse book. And when we do that, we realize, you know what? Not everything that is narrated is endorsed. Not everything that is allowed at every point is fully approved of. In fact, I would say this, that in the Bible, every person, every human person, and every initiative save one, is flawed or partial in one way or another. Now, some of you know who that one is, but if you're wondering, we will talk about him more as we go on. This Bible that we have is not a translation based on a translation based on a translation. It is attested by thousands of ancient ori uh, original language manuscripts. Uh, your English Bible has been influenced by earlier English translations, but it is by no means based on them. If you're using a newer translation, it's not based on an older translation. It's based on the thousands of Hebrew and Greek manuscripts of the Old and New Testament, respectively, on which we base our understanding of the original biblical text. Those manuscripts have themselves been studied by thousands of scholars over the centuries to understand what is the most likely original reading of the text, where those manuscripts vary. Do they vary? Yes, they do. But in any significant way that affects the meaning of the text that, that we read? No, and in nearly every instance, we can sort those out as to what was the most likely original reading. Now, what that means is that when we read the Bible, we may have various problems understanding it and very obje various objections to what it says, but we should never say, well, we can just have no idea what it's saying. We can. We can. And you don't have to learn to Greek, read Greek or Hebrew uh, to do that, thank goodness, because it's, I mean, I don't even have my Hebrew anymore, and I'm a professional, okay? So it's just, it's hard stuff. So there's a lot of tradition in the world about the Bible. Lots of things that people are accustomed to thinking that the Bible says. Some things that have been reinforced by the church over the centuries in its various manifestations. Lots and lots of layers of tradition. But the good news is that our knowledge of the biblical text that we have can actually help us cut through that to see what the Bible is actually saying. And I believe that our knowledge is in many ways improving as we continue to apply ourselves to these tasks. Now, the Bible is also not, is, is focused on explaining not natural phenomena, as does science, but explaining the human condition. I often ask my students, now you've heard people say that, that, you know, the Bible is about explaining why it rains and where babies come from and that kind of thing. Based on what you're reading, how much of what you're reading seems to address that? And they just kind of stop and say, wow, nothing? or nearly nothing, unless you're imagining that that's what it's trying to say, in which case you might find a few isolated things, but it's basically nothing. What is it trying to address? Well, I, I would put it this way. What the Bible is trying to address is not why does it rain, but how can a good and powerful God be this world's creator and ruler? A different way of, of putting it is, you know, the Bible is trying to explain who are human beings, why are we in such a mess, and is anything ever going to be better for us? Those are important questions. 
Those are questions about, to borrow a phrase, life, the universe, and everything. And, and that's what the Bible is grappling with. It, you know, when it deals with, with natural phenomena, it deals with it as people did in their time, because that's not the subject matter. The subject matter is, is something else. A different way to describe the Bible, a complementary way here, is that it is a reliable, brutally honest account of history, not just a collection of legends. A legendary book will extol its heroes and obscure their failures. Let me, let me borrow something. Uh, I'm from Indiana originally. Uh, no offense, okay? Uh, a recovering Hoosier, uh, which means I love basketball. But I have come to understand that I do not love basketball the way all y'all do. Okay? And, and so I join you uh, in celebrating the life and legacy of Joe B. Hall. Okay, who passed away. I heard an amen. Okay, all right, first one of the day. Um, yeah, there, there we go. Now, what kind of stories are people telling about Joe B. Hall right now? Good stories. Are there any bad stories about him? I don't want to know. And I'm from Indiana. Okay. Well, let me tell you, there are a lot of bad stories about Bobby Knight, but that's another matter. Okay? What do we, what do, we do with our heroes? We, we heroize them. We obscure their failures, and, and we, we amplify their accomplishments. Okay? What does the Bible do? Everybody in this book, save one, is a failure. Abraham says to Pharaoh, you know, she's not my wife, she's my sister. That is going to complicate your anniversary in years to come. Okay? David, a little matter of adultery and murder, okay? And, and some people would want to up the ante on the adultery, but we won't, discuss the, we won't discuss the particulars. Peter denies Jesus three times, says generally stupid things whenever he opens his mouth through much of the book, okay? What about Jesus? Well, here's the thing about Jesus. What's emphasized in the story is his shameful, painful death by torture. It's the focus of all four narratives about him in the Bible. So the Bible is emphasizing not what we would expect. It's not triumphalistic. It is brutally honest. And it needs to be taken seriously on those terms. So is there a way that we can, we can begin to put all this together? Let me suggest a couple of statements where I try to capture it. They're not adequate, but they may help point us in the right direction. The Bible is the saga of the creator's victory that he graciously shares with his people. God is taking his world back and he is welcoming us to benefit from that and participate in it. That is the message we have here. All of these books, this library, add up to a grand saga. Call this the real game of thrones. How will the good and powerful creator take back his world? Let's take a couple of examples. He's going to do it through a man named Abraham, who is elderly and childless and doesn't even own the land where he lives. He's going to do it through a weak, unlikely nation like Israel, which compared to the regional superpowers of its time, Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, is nothing. It's like an exit on the highway where the only thing is the Stuckies and it's closed. Okay? Really doesn't matter to much of anything at all. But in that context, in that context of weakness, God demonstrates his power and overcomes the might of the kingdoms of the world. And in particular, he addresses something that is, is vital to us. He promises to send to us his true prophet, his true king who will deliver his message and who will rule over the world in righteousness and with grace and mercy and justice. And when he sends that true king, he's Jesus of Nazareth, a man from an insignificant place, a man who has no worldly power or authority. Now, he is remarkable in that he acts and speaks with the kind of power and authority that could only be ascribed to Almighty God. Yet as we watch him closely, we see that he never uses it for his own advantage. You're the son of God. Turn these stones into bread. Mm -mm. No. He lives out a kind of humble obedience that you and I have not lived out because we grasp for power. We're like our first parents, you know, 
Oh, if you eat it, you will not surely die. You will become like God. We rebel against God trying to have the power for ourselves. He has the power, but doesn't use it for himself. And how does he ascend to his throne? By letting the Romans, the imperial power, the evil, pagan imperial power, put him to public death by torture on a cross. And God raises him from the dead and highly exalts him and gives him the name that is above every other name. And he calls and empowers his followers to carry his message into the world, to live with the kind of self-giving love in, in humility and service to others that shines God's light brightly in the world. And so there becomes a, a, a kind of a, a revolution that takes place in human society and the human heart that says God's power is made perfect in weakness. And this is how the light of God shines. Now, this answers the objections to other readings. Is this a legendary book? No. This is the most unexpected and subversive thing you can imagine. No human power can endure the, the scrutiny of this message. Not any national power, not any corporate power, not any individual power. We fall before this. Is this unenlightened? In the broad scope of things, this challenges all of our human pretensions. Every way that we try to take advantage of other people. Every way that we act unjustly and without love. And it shows us that there is no solution that human beings offer. No political solution, no military solution, uh, you know, no economic solution. Uh, not just a matter of eliminating the wrong kinds of people and putting the right kind of people in power. You can't do that and make the world better. That's the story of the Bible. God has done this in Jesus Christ and in his cross and in his resurrection. So is this an opiate of the people? Man, if you're rich and powerful, this book is coming for you. Okay? But if you are weak and lowly, it says this message is for you. So let's become weak and lowly. And so the Bible is a call to live lives defined by the cross of Jesus Christ. What is life all about? Well, as I said, our first parents wanted divine power for themselves, and so they rebelled against God. They didn't have it, but they wanted it. And they are paradigms of us. We have met the enemy. We know who the problem is. What's wrong with the world? I am, sincerely yours. But Jesus comes into the world having divine power and doesn't use it for his own advantage. He uses it to serve the weak, the lowly, the poor, the insignificant. And he takes that weakness and poverty and insignificance on himself, even to the point of death. He is with us. He is innocent. We are guilty, but he takes our guilt. He is powerful. We are weak, but he enters into our weakness. He dies for us. He suffers with us. And he calls us to live a life which is defined by following him on the way of the cross. This is amazing, this is remarkable, and this is better than anything you're going to find anyplace else. True liberation is not living for yourself, but living in submission to God in the image of Jesus, loving the unlovely, serving the unworthy, finding life by giving our lives. I suspect that our real problem in reading the Bible, my real problem in reading the Bible, is not the Bible. The problem is me and my desire to hold on to power to pretend that I can rule my own life. So some suggestions. How should we actually read the Bible? Well, Tyler's going to have a lot more to say about this. He's the practical guy. I use big words. Uh, but, but let me make a few suggestions. Read in a way that is sensitive to the saga. And this is going to sound weird. When you're reading the Bible, don't ask, what lesson does this have for me? Ask, how does it fit into the big story? How does this fit into the big story? It's only when we see how it fits into the big story that we can understand what it means for us. So we need to kind of adopt that as, as a framework. And if you're thinking, I don't really know what the big story is yet, there are ways of doing that. We'll talk about one, lots of others, but the key is to begin. Always read with Christ in the center. I'm, I'm confused at this point. Christ and Christ's cross at the center. I'm confused on this, on this text. I'm not sure what's going on here. Stop and ask, okay, Jesus died. How does that perspective help me understand the kind of thing that's going on here? 
And often, often we can get on a road that will help us to understanding. We need to lay down our hostility and our defensiveness. Are we having trouble understanding? Let's read in sympathy. I found that I am, generally speaking, a bad listener. But especially when I'm talking to someone and I start to feel defensive and I begin thinking about what I want to say in response. I make a really bad listener at that point. And just stopping and saying, nope, not going to do that, sometimes makes me a better listener. I think that makes us better readers, too, if we enter in in sympathy. And if you're on the outside of this Christianity thing, it's okay. You can suspend disbelief to investigate. All right? Now, as a practical step, you know, is there a resource you could, you, you could suggest? No, I only thought I ought to provide something like this today, and it only occurred to me to say something about it, uh, or, or we'd have a picture of this book. I want to recommend this best-selling book to you to get oriented to the Bible. It is by Sally Lloyd-Jones. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible, and it has pictures. And you're thinking, oh, my kids have that. <laughs> you should be reading that. You should be re A kid's book? Yes. Why? It's brilliant and simple. And if you think the children's literature isn't worthwhile, I want to introduce you to Beverly Cleary and Roald Dahl, among others. Okay? We all know it's great. And it's also kind of humbling to read a kid's book, isn't it? So... Just one recommendation. There could be many, many other routes. Let's remember, too, to be open to experiencing what others have found compelling. If we're reading only on our own, we're going to get stuck, and quite honestly, we're going to miss stuff. But you know what happens when you're reading in community? Then you're hearing what other people are saying. And you know, it's not that everyone's opinion is great, but everyone's experience together helps us understand more what God is saying to us. So however you're reading, make sure it's with your brothers and sisters. This book, there is so much there. You are, we are so blessed to, to have it, to have access to it. May it become a part of your unhurried rhythms. Let's, let's pray. Lord God, um, your, your grace is, is abundant expressed to us in so many ways, uh, and, and today we think of, of the grace that you have given us in this, this complicated, beautiful, honest book, set of books, the Bible. May we see your light and your life in this, in this sacred, inspired deposit. May we see the image of your Son and be conformed to it, and we pray in his name. Dr. Weatherly, stay right here, man. Oh, stay right. Hey. Dr. Weatherly stepped in at the last second to come teach us today, and we're so thankful for you. He's no, got some, not literally the last second, but close. But uh, but he's driving back in some some nasty weather. So today, say a prayer for him as he travels back to Tennessee. Pray that I'm not stupid. Yeah. Basically. There you go. Let's thank him again for being here. Thanks, man. I love how beautiful a picture he gives us of Jesus. And that helps us understand the Bible so much better. Helps us understand our faith so much better. And so as we prepare for a time of communion, we are going to do that by reading a scripture uh, in 1 Corinthians, where Paul affirms what happened in the Gospels in the Last Supper and then gives us a charge. Let's, let's read this together as we go. I'll read it for you. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then I love the charge that he gives us right here in verse 28. He said, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. And what he's saying is don't do this passively. Don't do this flippantly or hurriedly. Don't just drink it and eat it and not think about what's happening. But he says, examine 
yourself. And he says to de- discern the body of Christ. And what does that mean? Many believe it, it kind of points to two general things. One, to realize that these elements that we hold, the, the bread and the cup, that they relate to Jesus' body and his blood, and that it was his sacrifice that is our salvation, to remember that, to pay attention to that. Some also points to the idea that to remember the body of Christ is to remember Christ's body, the church. How are we loving those that we are around? Are we loving one another the way that we should? And the rest of that scripture points to a lot of different ways where we could be loving each other better. So, during this time, as we prepare our hearts for communion, will you take just a moment and examine yourself? Examine your heart. Discern the body of Christ to think about his body and his blood that were shed for us, for our salvation. To think about how we might better love one another. We do that and we'll take communion together in just a second. So let's now take that bread that reminds of his reminds us of his body that was broken for us and let's eat it together. As we take the cup that reminds us of his blood that was shed for us that covers our sins, our shame. Let's drink. And pray with me. Dear God, with glad and sincere hearts, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross that is our salvation. It is by grace through faith that you have saved us, Lord. Nothing that we have done on our own, but you've done it for us. Lord, we thank you for today as we get to learn a little bit more about your scripture of this love story that that you have written us that tells us everything we, we need to know to know you, to love you, and to follow you. And Lord, I pray that we make this a rhythm of our life, that we make reading your word part of our daily life, and that it changes us, God. It makes us into the people that you've called us to be. Thank you for today, God, as we got to worship you and hear from your word. Lord, may it change us as we leave here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank everybody for joining us, especially the folks who are online at home. Stay safe, folks. We're so glad you were here today. Everybody who's here, pray that you have a fantastic week, and we'll see you again next week. God bless you.